with like it's major okay. prosthetics. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Interesting. But it's not like All a special right, Olympics. It's, it's like and robot shit. Up, and now everything's okay. That's the best I can make it up here. Uh, does anybody have any trouble seeing the slides or anything? Okay. All right. Well, welcome to Anime USA 2015, and welcome to Toradora, or how to do good characters. My name is Justin Cole. I am a Toradora fanboy. I love Taiga, and I love Toradora, like, so very, very much. And I just wanted to have this panel on the About panel to give a little bit of overview about what the panel's going to be about. So this panel is going to be an overview of the characters and their relationships in Toradora and why they worked out so well, or why, in my opinion, they worked out so well. Um, Toradora's often got a lot of um, criticisms, and because it's so popular, people uh, there's backlash. People call it the greatest love story ever told, but people uh, have backlash against that, and they say, well, Taiga's not really a good character, she's too generic, she's too violent, or the main character has no personality, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to offer my views and my opinions on Toradora and the story. Now, of course, since this is a view of all the characters and their relationships, there will be spoilers. There will be massive Toradora spoilers. Mostly from the show, there are some spoilers from the light novel that are that I cover as addendums to what happens to the characters in the ending. Um, the light novel changes things a little bit. And there's also a visual novel aspect that I will not be covering because I don't believe that could be considered canon. Um, anyway, Toradora, I, I wrote an article about this a few months ago, and I've made some changes since then to the presentation. What I want to say, and what I said in the article is that this wasn't a review of Toradora, but the more I thought about it, the characters make up the entire story in Toradora, so when I'm looking at the characters, I'm kind of looking at every single aspect of the story itself. So this is kind of a pseudo-review but one that is very overwhelmingly positive. Anyway, structure of the presentation, I'm going to go over the common traits of each character, I'm going to go over the characters themselves, I'm going to go over their minor relationships. I will not be covering uh, characters like uh, Yasuko or Taiga's father in depth. I will be covering them as they uh, have, as their relationships affect the main five characters. I will, and then I'll be covering in a little bit of depth, depending on the character relationship, the relationship with each other. So let's go to the first, the first common traits within the story between all the characters. The first one I wanted to cover is running away. Now running away is a huge, huge share trait with every single character in the story. Every single person does it. Ami runs away, Ryuji runs away, Tiger runs away, um, Kitamura runs away, Minoru runs away. They all run away either physically or metaphorically. Some do both. Like Taiga and Ryuji, they do both, and Kitamura does both. But um, it depends, it, it varies from character to character, but I figured I would put it in a common trait uh, slide first because there's no point in going over the fact that every single one of them is running away over and over again. As I get to the characters themselves, I will be covering how exactly each one of them runs away in whatever way they do so. Um, and. The show is trying to tell you, it's trying to help characters and it's trying to tell the viewers that running away is a temporary solution. Um, it shows that the key characters, they can get away from their problems for a little while, but ultimately they have to go face those problems in order to overcome them and to become better people and more developed characters. And uh, so none of the characters do want to face their problems and that's why they end up running. So this one is a little bit uh, tricky to kind of give a common trait for, but it kind of goes hand in hand. There's integrity and hypocrisy. Now a lot of it, many characters are hypocritical. Many characters lack integrity in, uh, when they talk to each other. Uh, the biggest example of this, as I will get into, is Minori. She is incredibly hypocritical, hypocritical and she hates that in herself and she hates that in other people. And um, the reason why Taiga and Ryuji didn't end up together for so long is that because they were being hypocritical, they weren't being honest with themselves, they weren't being honest with each other, they weren't being honest with their friends. So they draw out a huge long relation. They they put a like they drive a wedge in between themselves for no reason um, because of their lack of communication. And uh, other characters like Samira are also guilty of this. The student council president, she's guilty of lying and being a hypocrite and uh, 
has to face her problems on her own as well. So the last common trait is the lack of communication between all of the characters. Now these characters are a very tight knit group, but they seem to have a problem talking to one another. Um, even the best friends of Taiga and Ami, or Minori, they they claim they're best friends, but they're always they're trying to just in the entire series they're kind of going behind each other's backs to try and force each other to be with Ryuji because they think that's what the other one wants. They can never tell for certain. Um, and they don't communicate with each other because they think that it will hurt the other person. Uh, Taiga and Minori's thought process is, I can't tell um, the other, I can't, Taiga is, is, I can't tell Minori that I love Ryuji because she'll be hurt and then the group will fall apart. And Minori's is the exact opposite with, or the same thing but with Taiga instead. And uh, Kitamura and Ami don't really factor into it for various other reasons. So, characters themselves. First one I want to cover is Yusaku Kitamura. And the thing I wanted to say here is that I believe all of the characters are well developed in Toradora. Unfortunately, Kitamura does not get nearly as much time as the other characters. He gets one episode of character development. And um, that is a student council arc. There's stuff leading up to it, but that one episode kind of encompasses all the character development he gets. He kind of falls off. Um, he is the heavy comic relief character. Very little character development, as I just said. He falls off later on. As the, uh, as the story progresses, his friendship is still there, but his relationship with Taiga, um, as I'll cover a bit later, it kind of just grinds to a halt because of various different factors, because of obvious different factors, because of things like episode two, and things like him confessing his love to the student council president. Um, so what, what is telling about uh, Kitamura that I picked up on my rewatch of the show when I rewatched it about a month or a month and a half ago is that he seems to like women who know how to assert themselves. He admits to liking Taiga, Ami, and Sumire. He says for Ami, he says um, she knows what she wants and that's I like that part about her. So he falls in, or he has a crush or falls in love with the, these kind of girls that all display these kind of similar personality traits, but he ultimately goes for Sumire because she's, she's very clear and very driven, very focused in what she wants. And that's leads me to their relationship. It was kind of the nail in the coffin for the Taiga and uh, Kitamura pairing. Anybody that still had hope after episode two, uh, after Taiga confessed and got rejected, this is kind of like the crushing blow to just say like, no, Kitamura's moved on. He's moved on from Taiga and he's moved on from any chance at a relationship they, those two have had. And uh, this is the arc where running away is highlighted. Kitamura runs away from home for a night and he dyes his hair blonde and um, to run away from his responsibilities and to run away from his problems because he thinks as a high schooler would, he thinks that would fix everything, but of course it doesn't end up fixing anything. And, he faces his problems and he faces, after Ami helps him face Sumire by going after Sumire by herself, um, she, Kitamura is able to overcome his own issues. And in a happier note in the light novel, after he graduates, he does go to chase after Sumire. So he has a happy ending in the light novel that wasn't shown in the anime, unfortunately. So now I want to get into the, now, with Minori, what I want to say about these next four characters is there can be a debate any which way about it, about these next four characters, how well developed they are over the other one. I personally think Kitamura is the least developed. These next four are too close for me to order. I did it in a specific way just to appease myself. The order I present them in does not have any relevance to how well developed I think they are. With that said, Minori is the cheerful girl, she is the responsible girl, she is the one that's friendly to everybody, she's also just wearing masks constantly. She is the one, when she acts out of character, she doesn't act like herself, or she tries to act honest, people start to question her. They're like, when she starts to, when she puts on the ball cap and starts like singing weird songs, everybody's like, you're acting weirder than normal. And so, the thing about Minori is that she's never completely honest with anybody. She tries to be honest with herself, but she just ends up coming off as a hypocrite. She is also an extremely hard worker because as is 
kind of directly said in the last few episodes, she hates anybody trying to help her at all. She shares that personality trait with Ryuji, kind of. She doesn't want anybody else's help to achieve her goals or to achieve her dreams. She shouts that at Taiga in the hallway. She uh, doesn't tell anybody anything because she doesn't want to confess to Taiga that she likes Ryuji because she knows what Taiga's trying to do. It pisses her off when Taiga tries to force them together into situations where they'll be alone. Um, but she's very protective of Taiga too. She, uh, when Taiga's dad comes back, she gets really angry at Ryuji. She's like, "Why? What are you trying to do? Why are you doing this? This is a huge mistake. You know, you don't know what you're doing." And then they have a little fight, and that gets resolved a little bit later on. She's uh, extremely insecure about getting receiving help from anybody. She doesn't want any help from Ryuji or Taiga, and she constantly pushes them away or avoids them in order to not receive their help and to do things on her own, which doesn't always work out in her favor. Uh, but on the flip side of that, she wants to be the one to help everybody. And the way this is shown is when she loses the softball game because of her mistake, she feels incredibly guilty, like depressingly guilty. And then of course she breaks the Christmas tree and that just is like a one-two punch to her conscience and to her um, emotions. So she kind of falls into almost a deep depression with all that stuff. And she also goes against the idea that she wants a relationship. Now whether this is because she's not sure what she feels like or whether she knows she'll be hurting Taiga, or mostly because she wants to keep the status quo, um, she knows that if she gets into a relationship with Ryuji, bad things could happen. They're not, it's not certain to happen, but it could happen, and that fact scares her. And so I just want to ask about the relationship thing. What's your reading then on the, um, I guess the summer episodes with the whole ghost thing when she was explaining to Ryuji how you know, she sees love like UFOs? Do you think she was being honest or just trying to... I'll get, I'll, I, I cover the supernatural talk um, with the Ryuji and Minori relationship. So yeah. I will get to that. That is very important, though. Uh, and the last thing about Minori uh, insecurity is she was never sure of what her friends were feeling. She had an inkling, a strong feeling that Taiga loved Ryuji, but she was never sure until she saw Taiga bawling in the street. And at that point, she was just like, I, uh, my hands are tied. I can't do this. Like, I can't lie to Taiga. I, I can't do this to Taiga. And she's also a giant hypocrite. And this is shown mostly through her confronting Ryuji at the end, which is a, another major scene. She sees her own hypocrisy in Ryuji because he's trying to lie to keep the status quo. No, they don't. She doesn't want the friend group to break apart, and neither does Ryuji, but that just causes issues by itself. And uh, she gets really angry at Ryuji because he's lying, and she sees that he's lying, and she knows he's lying, and she's just she's fed up with it. And uh, that was her final arc of her realizing that she was like kind of in the wrong the whole time. She was owning up to her mistakes and finally, finally being honest with herself. Oops. Next is Ami Kawashima, a lot of people's favorite character. A lot of people claim that she's the most well-developed and well-done character. I personally don't think so, but um, she is very well done. She's frustratingly well done as a uh, as a. Her character type is frustratingly well done. <laughs> um, she, first of all, she is the most independent out of all five characters. She is the most removed from everything happening because while she is friends with the other four, she doesn't ever really force herself or drive herself or to try and help them. She is very selfish. She's very self-centered, and she only wants to help herself mostly. And the reason she is in this whole mix is because she develops a crush on Ryuji. Um, she wears a mask as well. Uh, she claims that she's not going to lie to herself or anybody anymore. And we see that a little bit when she's being honest with the other four, when she's like, she's fed up with everything, she's pissed off at everybody. But um, when she's with other people or her other friends, quote unquote, she's kind of just being, uh, thanks. She's kind of just, you know, BSing the whole thing. She's, you know, still being, she's not being as, uh, overly uh, sweet and clumsy girl as she was in the first place, but she's definitely still laying it on a little bit. And um, she also is probably the most mature one, and she also forces people into action. 
she tries to subtly push Ryuji into doing something with Taiga, and that's the whole thing about them playing house together. She tries to just, just keeps tapping him. She doesn't ever want to like push him into it. She doesn't ever want to directly tell him because that kind of defeats the whole purpose. But she just taps him every once in a while, and she does, however, like fight with Minori a lot. Uh, so. One of her biggest traits is that she's mature, quote unquote. She is the teenager who is very mature, and this weighs on her heavily. Um, at one point, when she's talking to her teacher, her teacher is like crying in her arms because the teacher is the comic relief, and the uh, teacher says, "Oh my God, Ami, you're so mature." And Ami, you can just see her a look on her face. She's like, oh, "I'm the mature one." Okay, so. She's still like she's still a teenager. She doesn't want to be relied on by all these people all the time, especially because she's selfish. But she's built up that mask and that personality for herself, and she can't break that because that would just be weird and that would cause all the problems by itself. But she's gotten into herself into that situation, so she needs to keep all those say. And uh, while she was able to call everybody else out on their own BS, like she was able to call me knowing out her, her BS, she was able to call. Uh, Kitamura out and Sumire out. She called Ryuji out. She never called herself out. She never fully recognized that she was BSing all the, almost the entire time. And one of the last minor major points is she had a desire to be with a group of people that she could drop her mask and save in front of that would accept her for that. And that's what Ryuji did, and that's probably why she fell so hard for him, because he didn't treat her any differently. Uh, whether she was acting or whether she was being honest with herself. And unfortunately, because she was uh, wearing that mask when she first met Ryuji, and he was able to see through it, he never got any closer to her, and she has a deep regrets for that happening. So the next one is uh, the Ryuji picture. I right? got a scary face. Yeah, I, like, I, I chose that picture on purpose. Uh, so we know, we know the main character is we, we know a lot about him straight from episode one. He's concerned with his looks, he loves to clean, he loves to cook, he's very responsible, um, he's very independent. Uh, he has a good, very good relationship with his mother. And everybody, the reason he's never really, like, the, the face gag, the fact that he looks like a thug, it's never brought up a lot in the show because, you know, it's his first day in high school and when he gets done with, um, like, after a week, everybody's like, well, he's just like, he just looks scary. He's not scary. Um, and he also, one of his bigger traits is that he believes that there is inherent good to everybody. He believes it for Ami. He believes it for Tiger's dad. He believes it for everybody he comes in contact with, which is a problem, because that causes problems with Tiger and her dad. And he is, like Minori, he likes to help everybody all the time. And he also hates to receive help. Um, he has falling out with his mother because she tries to tell him that you can rely on other people from time to time. Um, and he shouts and yells at her and says some really nasty stuff to her because he, he thinks his way of thinking is the best way of thinking. And that, of course, echoes very closely Minori's personality. And his uh, relationship with Yasuko is that she's his mother, and she's the one to she's there to teach him that you can rely on other people. It's okay for you to ask for other people's help. Sometimes you need to ask for other people's help. Um, she showed him that she was able to be a single mother and raise a kid all on her own, and he was able to go to a nice school. He turned out to be a nice person. He fell in love with a nice girl. And without her there, he would have been almost totally helpless and lost because she was doing so much to provide for him. And now Taiga Aisako, my favorite character, my favorite one to talk about. Um, when I was doing this, when I was thinking of this panel originally, I was like, well, I probably could talk for Taiga with, with, about Taiga and Ryuji for an hour, but maybe not. I might just come off as rambling at some point. So I decided to go for all five just to be safe. But now we have the palm top Taiga. She is, at the beginning of the show, she is anger personified in this little ball of adorableness. Um, <laughs> She, uh, she has no friends except for Minori, for obvious reasons. Minori's nice to everybody, and they knew each other before this, and yada yada. And she is infamous. And now this is important because nobody knows her as a person. They all know her as a celebrity, or as an infamous uh, student. They know her as the Palm Top Tiger. They don't know her as Taiga Aisaka. 
which is important because it, everybody just projects an image onto her. Um, and now, the counterpoint to that is that she is an angel. She is extremely sweet. She uh, loves giving gifts to people during Christmas. When, she, when it's Christmas, she feels like she can drop her angry uh, persona because she's supposed to be nice during Christmas. And she has experiences directly tied to Christmas that are uh, extremely important to her and that she believes uh, she has her own very strong opinions about Christmas. And by the end of the series, she becomes a much nicer person. She realizes that she can't stay away from her family. She needs to go fix things because her family is important to her and her mother's side of the family anyway didn't really try and do any wrong by her. They were just trying to help her, but she just kept rejecting them for her own angry reasons. And the saddest thing about Taiga is that you see during the Christmas arc that she believes that she should be alone. She thinks that she doesn't deserve to be with anybody ever. Um, she pushes Ryuji to go see Minori at the Christmas party because she thinks, she's like, I don't deserve to be with anybody. This is how it's going to be forever. And of course, she hates that. She does not want that. She wants somebody that she can depend on, even though she doesn't ever say that to herself or anybody else. And now, Sundari is an interesting word here. Um, there could be a whole conversation about this alone. Taiga is definitely based on the Sundari archetype. Now, the issue I have with calling her a Sundari is that Sundari implies that she is just the character archetype. It, 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 it ignores the fact that she has a character of her own. She goes through her own progressions and development. And it could be argued, I won't argue it because it's too messy of a term, it could be argued that she is a deconstruction of the Sundari genre, or the Sundari archetype. Because she has reasons for why she's so angry. She has reasons for why she turns out to be such a good person at the end. She's not angry towards just Ryuji. She's angry towards everybody at the beginning of the show. Sundares are usually hate love with just the person they are interested in. Taiga just hates everybody at the beginning of the show. And um, now, with her father, it was a learning point for Taiga and Ryuji. She'd already been hurt by her father once, but she decided to give him another chance for whatever reason. Uh, because Ryuji kind of pushed him, pushed her into it, and she trusted Ryuji to, because she wanted to try and believe that her father wasn't such a terrible person. Unfortunately, this plan backfires, and she realized she, this kind of reinforces her own negative belief that she deserves to be alone and that nobody wants to. Um, nobody really wants to be around her. She doesn't. She, nobody wants to love her. And one of the lessons that Ryuji learns here is that just because they're your family doesn't make them a good person and money cannot buy family. You can't win over your relatives with just by just by throwing money at them. You have to actually honestly care about them. So now we into the character relationships. And the way I want to structure this is I'm just going to go, I want to take one character, go through their relationships, take another character, go through their relationships, except the ones I've touched on already, and so on until we're done. Um, so, first one I wanted to cover is uh, Yusaku and Ami. Now, the um, relationship between these two is that they've known each other since they were their childhood friends and they've known each other for a very long time. Um, they kind of know each other in a little bit of a complex way. They know how the other one acts and they know how the other one, um, they know when the other one's lying and they know when they're not being honest with each other and everything and so, so on and so forth. And, um, the way this is shown is Ami kind of makes fun of Yusaku when he's acting out during his art. Um, she, everybody else is kind of like really concerned. They're like, why is Kitamura running away? Why is he dying his hair blonde? And she's just like, he's so stupid. Like, <laughs> what is he doing? And um, she does that because she knows how stupid it is and because she knows that he's just, you know, kind of being dumb. And um, the thing about that was, uh, that's, I'll cover that in the next slide here, which discusses their relationship during the student council arc. Uh, and then the thing about Yusaku is he lets Ryuji on to Ami's acts, like from immediately. The first time they meet her in person, Yusaku's like, she is not honest at all. Like, do not trust what she's saying. 
in the least bit. And then Ami tries to keep winning over Ryuji until she until that whole stalker incident. And uh, so Kitamura ended up bringing Ami to that specific school on purpose so that she could um, make those kind of friends and get away from her own problems for a little bit at least. And uh, during Yusaku's arc, Ami, as she is prone to do, doesn't seem to care. She is like, I, it's his problem. I, it doesn't affect me in any way. I do not see why I should get involved here. Um, the most frustrating thing for Ami is when Sumire starts making fun of Yusaku because it's obvious to uh, Ami that Sumire has feelings for Yusaku. And so by herself, Ami goes up to Sumire and calls her out on it. She's like, you're not fooling anybody. Like, we know you are, I know you like Yusaku. Why are you doing this? And then that, that plus the fight kind of boils over into getting Sumire to confess that yes, she likes Yusaku and she was only uh, lying to uh, protect him to make sure that he didn't like try and do anything stupid like follow her immediately to America, which would probably destroy his life educationally at least. And it shows that Ami, at some level, she does care about her friends, she does want to help them, uh, but her outward appearance is extremely cold towards them. It takes a lot of uh, pushing against her to try and uh, for her to care about her friends. So the next one is the one that I probably talked about the least. Yusaku and Minori, the, uh, I think it will, yeah, I've got one slide on this. They're the comic relief characters. Uh, every time they're together, uh, some, some like crazy is happening. There's a, Minori's taking pictures of Yusaku posing in a towel, and the towel falls off, um, or they go on a ghost hunt, and it ends up Yusaku and Minori were just fooling, or they were pulling a reverse prank on Taiga and Ryuji. And, uh, you know, they're the athletic ones, they, they understand each other's uh, sports and hobbies and all that stuff, but they don't really have too complex of a relationship. It's pretty simple. They're just friends, they're nice to each other. And uh, the one interesting thing to note here is that the premise of the show is that Taiga and Ryuji are trying to get each other together with Minori and Yusaku. But what ends up happening is that Yusaku and Minori end up pushing Taiga and Ryuji together. Uh, be behind the scenes, kind of. They just kind of, they don't, you always see Taiga and Ryuji's attempts, but you kind of indirectly see the efforts of uh, Yusaku and Minori pushing the other two characters into their own relationship. And uh, they kind of do it way better than Taiga and Ryuji were trying to do the other, uh, trying to push each other towards the Yusaku and Minori. They do it much more subtly, they do it much less obviously. And, so it ends up working out a lot better for them. So now we have Yusaku and Ryuji. Um, they're the best friends. They're the parallel to, Tai to Minori and Taiga uh, that the show needed to work in the first place. Uh, they're always willing to support each other. Uh, there's not a whole lot of depth to that. They're just the best friend archetype kind of broken down a little bit. You'll see in plenty of harem shows. Um, the main character, the guy, the nice guy, has a best friend who's goofy and uh, crazy and wacky, but that character's never really expanded on. Well, in Toradora, he was expanded on, at least, a, at least a little bit, to show that he does have his own character and his own personality. And uh, the greatest interaction they had was during Yusaku's arc, where Yusaku runs away and Ryuji comes and knows where he's sitting, and knows, what, uh, knows just what to say to get him to like lead back into action and to realize what kind of mistake he was actually making. And then we have Yusaku and Taiga. Now this is one of the bigger relationships in the show because they are the couple that I believe that never had a chance in the first place. Uh, Yusaku had already moved on. He confessed to Taiga in middle school and Taiga rejected him because she didn't know how to respond because nobody had really probably confessed to her at that point. Um, but when Taiga tries to confess to Yusaku, he kind of just brushes it off. And this is the first like really sweet moment I saw on the show, where Taiga's confessing to Yusaku and he just changes the subject. He's like, how do you feel about Ryuji? And she's like, well, I hate him. And she, Yusaku goes, are you sure about that? And she goes, no, I don't actually hate him. He's nice to me. He, uh, bake, he makes me food, he makes me lunch, 
He uh, cleans up my apartment. He, she, she just lists off a bunch of nice things, kind of begrudgingly about Ryuji. And that's when it kind of clicked in Yusaku's head. He's like, she likes him. She doesn't actually like me. She's got like, she's infatuated with me. She likes him. And so then, if that wasn't enough, there was also Shimira. And the, the strange thing the show does, though, is it throws a few curveballs. Uh, with the dance, like here, it puts hope back into the fact that there might be a chance for this relationship. And then during New Year's, uh, Taiga tells Ryuji that she went by herself with Yusaku to uh, get copy. And the interesting thing about their relationship as well is at some point, Ryuji, towards the end of the series, Ryuji points out to Taiga, he's like, you're talking to him normally now. Uh, like a while ago, you couldn't even like make eye contact with him or be in the same room with him without blowing up. And she just kind of, she's like, yeah, I guess, it's whatever. And uh, she doesn't make a big deal out of it. But the fact that she always was, you know, turning red or stuttering over her words or being in clutch when he was around kind of showed that their relationship couldn't work in the first place. Because what, what kind of relationship is it where one person can't even communicate with the other? That ends up being like kind of an une uneven thing. And uh, in the end, she really only interacted with her, him one-on-one -on -one a few times, like when she walked home with him, or when during New Year's, or the dance. There was very few instances of that. And uh, yeah, after after her, when she when he breaks her heart, kind of, she ends up kind of getting over it. At least it's implied that she's over it because she's able to talk to him normally. She's able to. Uh, hang around him without being a klutz or being weird or anything like that. And the, I know I said final nail before, but the ultimate final, like, the beating a dead horse was when she confessed to Yusaku in the um, snowstorm. She's like, I can't stop loving Ryuji. Please take these feelings away from me. And that's telling of Taiga and Ryuji's relationship a lot more than Yusaku and uh, Taiga's, but she thinks she's telling it to Yusaku, which kind of implies that she wants she wants to tell somebody. So that we have Minomi and Anami. So these two characters are the real, they really hate each other. Like, they're friends, but they just kind of really hate each other. Like, Taiga and Anami, which I'll get to in a second, they're like shown to like, oh, they make, they call each other names and do a bunch of stupid pranks on each other. But these two, like, Ami starts to really get fed up with Minori's BS. Um, Ami calls her on it a few times, and it takes Minori getting called. She, she needs somebody to call her on it, because if nobody had called her on it, she would have just kept doing the same thing over and over again. So thanks to Ami, Minori was able to eventually mature. She had been um, pushed time and again by Ami to mature, and she finally did so. And that's, in the end, that's why uh, Ami helps her out. She blocks the door, and uh, not just because of that she saw that she needed to stop Taiga from escaping, but she noticed that Minori had finally owned up to the fact that she was being immature and hypocritical. And she was like, okay, now I'll give you my help, because you're finally doing the right thing. And uh, so Ami sees that all resolved peacefully, and kind of. So then we have Minori's relationships and Minori and Ryuji. And as opposed to the Taiga and Kitamura relationship, their relationship was very close to actually happening. Um, there's strong uh, there's strong evidence to indicate that if Minori had confessed or Ryuji had confessed early on in the show, they probably would have ended up together. Uh, but Within a few episodes, Minori saw that Taiga was beginning to develop feelings for Ryuji, so she backed off. And she, the problem with this relationship ever happening is that uh, Ryuji always put Minori on a pedestal. He's like, she's so nice, she's so friendly, she's so, she works so hard, and, you know, how could I ever measure up to something like that? He thinks he doesn't deserve her. And that's not, it's also not how you make a relationship work. They can't be, one can't be above the other. That's, that doesn't cause healthy relationships to happen. And uh, Taiga, thankfully, was the catalyst for them to become equals. 
but because it was so far on, it was kind of too late for that to happen. And, um, you know, from the beginning of the series, uh, she's less serious. She goes, uh, she takes them up on the roof and she goes to Ryuji. She said, please take care of Taiga. And Ryuji's like, well, it's not like that. But Minori's pleading with him. She knows it's going to happen. She's like, just please take care of Taiga. Just don't let anything bad happen to her. Um, and yeah, here's the supernatural that they talk about. They have this conversation twice. First time is during the beach episode. Um, and then when they're on, alone and on the deck, one of the very few one-on-one -on -one interactions they have. And the next time is during the um, Christmas arc. And both of these times, it's, you know, they're talking about the supernatural, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that they're just talking about relationships. Um, Minori talks about how she wants to see a ghost. She uh, has been searching for a ghost, so on and so forth. She wants something like that to happen. And Ryuji kind of tries to imply, like, well, you know, maybe, you know, I could help you search for that ghost. And maybe I could be that ghost or something like that, something along those lines. And she just kind of brushes it off. And then later on, when it's brought up in the Christmas arc, she finally just straight up tells Ryuji, I don't want to see any ghosts. I am better off without seeing any ghosts at all. So she's just telling him subtly, um, metaphorically, she's like, I don't want to be in a relationship. Uh, because before that, like before she went and talked to him, she'd seen Taiga crying in the middle of the road. Uh, and probably the most heartbreaking scene in the entire show. Um, and it also is extremely likely that things would have turned out very differently if Taiga just didn't exist at all. That it almost is certain they would have ended up together. So now we have Minori and Taiga. And they are the best friends. But their relationship is a little more complex than Kitamura and Yusak, or Ryuji. Because the two of them never communicated well with each other. They never really said anything to each other. They had to figure out the other one liked Ryuji um, much later than they should have. And the issue with that is Taiga never told Minori. She, Minori found out when Taiga was crying in the middle of the street. And Minori never told Taiga until the very end when it was already kind of set in stone that they were, Ryuji and Taiga were going to end up together. Um, Minori's confession came way after everything was already set in stone. And uh, the reason they weren't communicating is because they wanted to protect the other person. They think the other person needed help when the other person could have done very well just by themselves. They misinterpreted the fact that, yes, you need to help other people sometimes, but sometimes you just need to back off and let them do whatever they need to do to get through their own issues. And it was the blind leading the blind. It was, um, they weren't talking to each other, so one was trying, it was a circular thing. Like one was trying to help the other, while the other was trying to help the other. They were trying to achieve the same end goal, but because they were doing it to themselves and doing it to each other, neither one of them reached the end goal until 26 episodes, however long, two cores, uh, 20x episodes in. Which I'm actually very happy, by the way, that Toradora was that long. Upon a rewatch, I don't think this whole thing could have worked in 12 episodes or 13 episodes. Because there was, by that point, there was not nearly enough development to make a relationship between Tiger and Ryuji believable. Anyway, um, and there was Tiger's thoughts that she needed to be alone yet again. So now we have Ami and Ryuji. And I chose this picture very specifically. A lot of the other pictures were kind of just chosen because they're funny or whatever. But this, this picture is pretty telling um, because Ami is always kind of up in Ryuji's space. She's like, she never kind of lets him breathe. She's always just like on top of him. She's in his personal space, she's in his physical space all the time because she's trying to like get with him. He just, it makes him uncomfortable. Like, you see the look on his face here, he's like, what the hell are you doing? Get away from me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of the pair, the pair that you might see in a harem. This is kind of the, you see the girl always like getting up on the guy or like, you know, trying to seduce the guy but the guy is not having any of it. And Ryuji, he's dense in some ways, but he can probably tell, even though he doesn't ever directly say it, he probably is able to tell, like, yeah, she's coming on to me, but I'm not having any of it because I know what she's actually like. And he doesn't want someone like that. And uh, Ami is ruthless about it. She 
tries to get into situations where she's alone with him. She tries to take him away from the whole group dynamic of the thing. It's just her and him. In her eyes, it's her and him. It's not her, Taiga, and Inori. It's just her and him. But unfortunately, it becomes apparent to Ami that Ryuji doesn't have eyes for anybody but Taiga. And then she starts uh, yeah, playing the house playing house with uh, Ryuji. She's like, she tells him twice at least. She's like, you need to stop playing house. You need to stop babying Taiga. You need to help yourself. You need to realize that you have an issue and she has an issue, and the only way you can help each other, you need to help each other, you need to stop babying each other. And that's what the whole, she never directly told him, because she didn't want him to, she wanted him to figure it out by himself. Uh, if she had just straight up told him, it might have not have gone as well, or, or it might have not have cemented the relationship as much. And the reason that, Ami, or it's Ryuji, or Ami develops the crush on Ryuji is because he ends up accepting her personality for what it is. She is a, she's a liar and she's a hypocrite and all that. She's not. She's, she acts like she's sweet and mature, but she's actually extremely selfish and uh, kind of brash. But Ryuji accepts that about her when probably no one else had in the first place. And now we have Ami and Taiga who have the hate-hate relationship. They never really have the love-hate relationship. They never really, really friends, quote-unquote, with each other. They barely ever act like friends to each other. But um, is always calling uh, Ami Bakachi a uh, stupid chihuahua. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of just how Taiga would treat. It, pro it probably isn't how she would actually treat a stranger. She's calling it because she knows that Ami won't get like upset or anything. She, Ami, Taiga knows at some level that Ami can deal with insults like that, and that she can dish it and take it. So, uh, but the nice thing about their relationship is it's a very uh, develop. It's a very strong development for Ami's character when she sees Taiga indirectly does this, but Taiga shows Ami that you have to sometimes run into your problems. You can't like avoid them all the time. That was Ami's running away. Ami's trying to run away from her stalkers and media attention, but they followed her. So she didn't know what to do. She almost broke down. But then Taiga goes and beats the crap out of the photographer. And Ami's like, you can do that? Like, aren't they scary? And Taiga doesn't care. So Ami just goes after the photographer and beats him to crap. And she's like, well, now I know what I have to do in the future. And that's mostly due to Taiga. And, uh, yeah, Ami helps out at the very ending and helps Taiga and Ryuji realize that they love each other as her kind of final friend act. Now we get to uh, Taiga and Ryuji, and I have not enough time to talk about this for you. Um, well, because I could talk about this relationship for at least 30 minutes or an hour anyway. So, Taiga and Ryuji, the one of the most important things I want to mention here, one of the most brilliant things that the show did. It's from the beginning of the show. They said the tiger has always stood equal with the dragon. The dragon has been the only creature to stand equal with the tiger. And that is their whole relationship, like, bundled up and sent to you in a nice little package in one line of dialogue. They are equals. They are not putting each other on the pedestal. They know how to be open and honest with one another. They are friends until the end, no matter what happens in the show. And the second most, the second thing I want to touch on, I believe, yeah, I believe I have bigger slides on all of this. They're always together. They, Taiga was always depending on Ryuji, and in some ways Ryuji was depending on Taiga. And they have the most natural and the most flowing relationship. So what did I want to get into is that they are always together. The students made the initial assumption that they were a couple, and that's because they were walking to school together. Uh, there were rumors that Taiga was going into Ryuji's house. And even though Ryuji had a crush on Minori, nobody knew that. They just saw like, well, Taiga and Ryuji are together, so they're a couple. And after dispelling that rumor initially, of course, Minori and Yusaku knew that, that they were, it was getting to that. And the other students probably saw it coming, even if they laid off of the rumors themselves. And. Uh, the one thing you want to know is that as you as a viewer, you notice it too. Do you notice that any time they're not in the same room as each other, it just feels weird. Like, 
Um, one of the most telling things about this is during New Year's, when Taiga goes to get coffee with um, Yusaku, uh, Ryuji flips out a little bit. He's like, where's Taiga? Like, you went, you went with him by yourself? Like, why didn't you tell me? And she's like, well, I don't need to tell you everything. And while that's true, it just is very telling of, uh, you kind of see that they're never really separate in the show. There's way more screen time of them together than there is of them separately. Even the fact where like, they're staying in each other's houses, they're not staying overnight, but they're staying there long enough to hang out with each other. And uh, when she leaves by herself, Ryuji doesn't know what she's doing, and he drops everything he's doing to run after her because he knows what she's probably thinking. He's on almost on the same wavelength of her spot, and that ends up in the Christmas scene. But it's just the, the viewer notices when they're alone, uh, not together with each other, and Ryuji notices when Taiga's not with him. He always wants to, doesn't always want to keep marks on Taiga, but he just freaks out when she's not close to him because that's not normal to him. <clears throat> so Taiga has extreme dependence on uh, Ryuji because it was very apparent from the beginning of the show that she didn't know how to take care of herself. She was always coming to, over to his house. He was going over to clean her house and to wake her up and to make her uh, breakfast and lunch and walking her to school and making sure she never got sick and all that stuff. And uh, she, he did take her or teach her to take care of himself, herself. Um, halfway through the show or during the Christmas arc, Taiga kind of coldly rejects him. She's like, I don't need you to come over here anymore. I can take care of myself. Like, and she kind of totally ignored the fact that he wasn't doing it because she wanted him, or she needed to be taken care of. He was doing it because he wanted to take care of her, uh, because he likes feeling like he's needed. He likes feeling like he's dependent on her. And uh, Yasuko and Ryuji, uh, one of the strongest points for Taiga is that they made her feel, they made her know what a family felt like. And I didn't get into this with Taiga, and I wanted to, is that um, from the beginning, or from before the show, it was pretty apparent that she was violent. There was one line that says that she got into an incident at her Catholic school over violence. And this is most likely due to her family situation. Her family was cracking apart. Um, her parents divorced from each other. And that led to a very negative environment for Taiga, which is also a pretty interesting thing the show did. In a lot of anime and a lot of Japanese culture, family is a very strong sense of belonging and is a very comforting thing. For Taiga, it was the exact opposite. It was shunning and it was um, running away and it was, um, she didn't, she obviously didn't feel comfortable at all, like anywhere close to any of them. But this was kind of rebuilt. It was deconstructed and then it was reconstructed into the fact that she gained a family uh, through Yasuko and Ryuji. And it's kind of telling the viewer, like, family is whatever you make it. Family doesn't have to be the, whoever gave birth to you, whoever. If they're terrible to you, they don't have to be your family. They don't, you don't have to show them respect if they just try and buy you off. Um, and that showing her what a family was and showing her how good a family would be, could be led, led her to making amends with her own family. And the other thing here with her dependence is that Taiga kind of hints that she wants to be someone to depend on. She wants someone to kind of bait her, you know, treasure her. She never, she, out, she acts independent, but it's pretty clear throughout the series that she wants somebody like Ryuji to take care of her. Um, because she had been alone throughout her entire life, so she wanted somebody uh, to be by her always and to take care of her and to love her and all of that. And they are the most, the thing I love the most about their relationship is that they're so natural with each other. They're always talking as equals, they're never stumbling over their words with each other. It's just the simple things like, I noticed during the beach arc, they're just sitting in the room late at night thinking about how they're going to prank me Nori or whatever scary thing happened to them. And Taiga's just got her feet in his back. And that's, it's, it's nothing weird. And not, like, it's, you, you feel like it's totally comfortable and natural that these two would be doing this with each other. Because they've been together for so long and they know without even thinking about it that they kind of belong together. 
Tyga always went out over to his place, even without thinking about it. Like, she never considered that a, a high school girl going over to a high school boy's house, uh, at least in Japan, and even sometimes in America, it's kind of looked at as like, well, obviously they're dating, right? Like, they're always, it's not even with a group of people, they're just going over to each other's houses all the time. Um, even if they do live right next to each other. Uh, and they're always speaking as equals to one another. And uh, it was always them, it was always the small, the tiniest things with them. It was them talking every single night. Um, you can see it at one point when Ryuji goes, or Taiga kind of shuts the window on him, or she, she's kind of trying to coldly reject him. He asked her, what are we going to talk about tonight? And that implies that they've talked like for countless numbers of nights throughout their entire time relationship about whatever, just across from each other. They probably talk long in the nights about some things because they just have that kind of relationship where they can do that kind of thing. And the last thing I wanted to reiterate is that the tiger always has stood equal with the dragon. And Taiga and Ryuji were always equals throughout the entire show. And it took way too long for them to realize that they were perfect for each other. It took an entire three years for them to finally uh, figure out that they needed to be together. And um, of course, I didn't put it on the slides here, but there's the after credit scene where she comes back after making amends with her family, and that's the happy ending. And Ryuji's okay with her leaving in the first place because he knows that she'll come back, or that he believes that she, he has enough faith in her that she will come back. And now in the light novel, it's not nearly as long. She, um, I believe she leaves during the summer and comes back before the third year starts, as opposed to leaving during the summer and coming back, or during the break and, leave, and coming back when the end of the, when graduation happens. So in the light novel, um, they do meet up, they hold hands, and they go off to meet their friends again. And uh, happy ending, obviously. Um, in the visual novel, which I don't think is canon, uh, there's a bit of, that shows them starting a family together. So whatever you believe about high school relationships or about true love, I want, I just, you know, say no to all logic and just believe that they ended up together forever and ever because I love that pairing so much. Um, <laughs> so as in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that Toradora has very well done characters and they're not just one trick ponies, not even Yusaku. I just want to be able to, I wanted to try and convince everybody or give them uh, tips on how to argue for Taiga or for Ryuji or for Ami or maybe even against any of them. And uh, these characters have very complex interactions with each other. Taiga and Ryuji aren't in a relationship because they say they are, like in so many shows. They're in a relationship because it is a relationship. They just fall into this naturally, and they find each other without having to force anything on. And uh, I still think, I half jokingly call it, but I still think it's one of the greatest love stories in anime anyway I've ever seen. Um, and there is one more slide, and that is the best quote from the show. And it is, if you trip while running down the hallway, you get a nosebleed. If you trip in real life, you cry. But as Torador tells you, you can always pick yourself up and try again, no matter how many times it takes. Thank you for coming. Get this thing off of me.